Okay. Is everyone on? I can't tell. Or are there people that were missing? I see Casey, Celia, Taylor, Leah. We're missing Marwell, right? Is there a password? No. <laughs> Charles can't get back in. He can't get back in? Nope. He can't on his phone. He's trying to get on his work laptop. Oh my gosh, this is such a mess. What about Marwell? Is Marwell left out? Correct. It's not here either. <laughs> Marwell, can you log on? Uh... <clears throat> Watch me have to FaceTime this man. All right, let me call him. He can at least listen. Oh, wait, he's going through the app store. Oh, the struggle. Okay, well, it's recording, so I think we'll be okay. Um, and Charles, you'll just have to go sit next to Celia. Okay, so today we're gonna be talking about sterilization. Now, this is an issue um, that a lot of people run into problems with when they're studying for their exam because um, sterilization is something that I feel you really benefit from being able to participate in the process or um, to at least be familiar with it, like physically, if you can see it. Now, when I prepared for my test, I didn't have access to a hospital. Um, I didn't have access to like, just go down to the SPD department and then see how they do their um, sterilization of instruments. Obviously I do now. And so one of my biggest recommendations is if you can, um, try to spend some time with like a local IP if you don't have access to a sterilization um, department then reach out to me <laughs> reach out to Charles reach out to literally any IP that you can to see if you can just come spend some time um, at the hospital so you can see what it is so one of the things that's really key to know when it comes to sterilization is your spal your spalding classification um, spalding classification is really, really important for your CIC exam. You need to be able to think about instruments and devices and automatically start thinking what category would they fall into? Are they a non-critical device, semi-critical device, or a critical device? So what is what constitutes a non-critical device? Like what would what would you say that's defined as? A blood pressure cuff. Blood pressure cuff, yes. Okay, good. That is an example of a non-critical device. Anything else? No? Okay. So those are gonna be objects that touch only intact skin. Blood pressure cuff is a perfect example of what a non-critical device would be, all right? What about a semi-critical device? What would that be? What would the definition for that item be? Or an example of one? Charles, Casey. So, sorry, I thought I was muted. Um, Semi-critical. That's like a uh, endoscope. Okay. It is. And why? Why would it be? Why would an endoscope be considered semi-critical? Taylor, you told me this today. Because it touches the mucous membranes. We go, Tay. Yes, Tay. Good job. Of objects which touch mucous membranes or skin that is non intact. And then a critical. What would be a critical device? Surgical instruments. Yes. Good job, Casey. So, objects which normally enter sterile tissue or the vascular system through which blood flows. Now with this spalding classification, what you need to understand is that with every single classification, there comes different methods of disinfection. 
that need to happen. So for a non-critical device, that's just gonna be making sure you're wiping down your equipment. Semi-critical would be high level disinfection and then critical would be sterilization. Okay, so concept check. Endoscopes are considered semi-critical items. Based on the Spalding classification, what is the recommended method of disinfection? A, cleaning followed by sterilization, B, cleaning followed by high level disinfection, C, cleaning followed by ultrasonic washer, or D, alcohol disinfection. Charles. Is it, what is B? <laughs> yes, it's cleaning followed by high level disinfection. So remember, semi-critical items, contact mucous membranes or non-intact skin. This category includes respiratory therapy and anesthesia equipment, some endoscopes, laryngoscope blades, esophageal manometry probes, cystoscopes, anorectal manometry catheters, and diaphragm fitting rings. These medical devices should be free from all microorganisms. However, small numbers of bacterial spores are permissible. Semi-critical items minimally require high level disinfection using chemical disinfectants, okay? Now, this is one of the YouTube channels that I actually really enjoy watching. His name is um, Brandon, and he, the, the title of his YouTube channel is The Sterile Guy. It's one of the channels that I really used a ton to prepare for my CRCST, um, it, you know, Central Sterile Technician Certification. And I find his videos really useful. It, they're displayed in a way that the content is not very long. It's very opposite to what I do. My stuff is usually like super long, like you know, our group meetings are an hour long, um, but his is about like four minutes, five minutes, 10 minutes in time. And so I highly recommend if you are not familiar and if you like auditory and visual things, you wanna see things, you need to hear things in order for you to remember them, then you need to try to find ways to do that. Um, and I have always told you guys, YouTube is my thing when it comes to preparing for any type of certification. I watch videos on YouTube, I read up on stuff, you have to find what works for you. Okay, so sterile definition, sterile or sterility, state of being free from all living microorganisms in practice usually describes as a probability function, example, as a probability of a microorganism surviving sterilization being one in one million. So that is your sterile definition. And that is very important for your CIC exam. There's gonna be a couple definitions that you're gonna to wanna to make sure that you know really well. Um, one of those is gonna be sterile. Another one is gonna be decontamination. Decontamination is really important. They like to throw that one in at all times. And so you need to make sure that you know those definitions. All right, so sterility, this is what they're referring to. Right? Is there a way to ensure that an instrument or a device is 100% free of all microorganisms? Can you, with even with all of the parameters that we have in place, with all the chemical indicators, biological indicators, all of the different things that we have in place, can you be certain, 100% certain that an item is sterile? This is where your sterility assurance level comes into. So the concept of what constitutes sterile is measured as a probability of sterility for each item to be sterilized. This probability is commonly referred to as the sterility assurance level at the product uh, of the product and is defined as the probability of a single viable microorganism occurring on a product after sterilization. The ster sterility assurance level is normally expressed as 10 to the negative power. Sal is an estimate, it's an estimate of lethality of the entire sterilization process and is a conservative calculation. So here you have 10 to the negative one, 10 to the negative two, and on the right-hand side, you have your probability of survival. So when they're referring to sterility assurance level, when they're referring to a sterile item, it's gonna be 10 to the negative six, okay? So which process is defined as the process of preventing contact with microbes? Sterilization, cleaning, asepsis, or disinfection? Marwell, I haven't heard anything from you. What do you think this is? Sorry, I was having a moment there. Um, I'm going to go with, based on what we were talking about, sterilization. Is that that your is final not answer? my final answer, but that's where I'm going. Is that your final answer? No, but that, that's where we're going with this. Okay, does anyone um, disagree? Or does everybody agree with sterilization? I disagree. What do you think it is, Charles? Um, 
So hold on, how do I get to the, I can only see part of the question. What's after preventing contam, is it say preventing contamination with microbes? Preventing contact with microbes. Yeah, the process that does that is gonna be cleaning. <laughs> okay. No, <laughs> I think it's disinfection. I really do. <laughs> I can't tell by your face. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, now I'm thinking about asepsis because we're talking about preventing contact with microbes. Oh, and then I remember yeah, asepsis about, technique. Yeah, I like that, Marwell. I'm with Marwell now. See, finally. I'm thinking about Ignaz, Mr. Ignaz Semmelweis and, you know, him, poor guy dying of sepsis. So, yeah, that's my final answer. Sep asepsis. You already did your final answer, so that's my final answer. See. <laughs> Listen, that was my non final answer. <laughs> Okay, so asepsis is correct. This is the reason why I tell you definitions are so, so, so important. Um, sterility, if we go back, right, if something is sterile, it's a state of being free from all living organisms, and that's what you need to look for. Which process is defined as the process of preventing contact with microbes? That's going to be asepsis. Aseptic technique is the process of carrying out activities that will maintain objects and areas free of microbes to the greatest extent possible. I put this question here because I assumed some of you would be leaning towards sterilization because that's what we're talking about. But this is why definitions are so important. Okay, so sterilization. This is the way that it has really helped me to, I'm gonna be honest, when I took my CIC exam, when it came to sterilization, it was one of my weakest areas. And I felt like um, it was very muddy. Like when I took my exam, it all felt very muddled. I just kept having different things popping in my brain with different types of questions and I felt like it wasn't very organized. Um, it, it was the same way when I took my CPH exam and I was on my biostat section and it was just like super muddy. Like I couldn't, you know, separate things apart. So remember this, you, for sterilization, you're gonna separate it into two categories. You're gonna have your high temperature sterilization and then you're gonna have your low temperature sterilization. Now, I made this based off how the CDC document guidelines for cleaning, disinfection, and sterilization are written out, where you have your low temp and you have your ETO, hydrogen peroxide gas plasma, and your parasitic acid on, under one category. But it's really important to remember that not all um, low temperature disinfection is stated here, all right? You're missing ozone in here. There's other things that you're missing under low temp but I made it the way that the document was um, written. I don't love it 100%, but CDC made it that way, so that's okay. Um, I just think that the way that they um, portray the, the information, they have these three main categories, and then under other methods of disinfection is where they put additional methods of low temp. Okay, so history of sterilization. I really enjoy stories. Stories are really fun for me. History, I think is really interesting. So I texted some of you this video, but for those of you who didn't get the text, um, this is a 12 minute video on the history of sterilization where they literally talk about where it started back in the day where they used to boil instruments, all of this really fun stuff. They mention our friend Ignaz Samovice in, um, in that video. So it's really great. Um, but this is an example of one of the first um, uh, sterilizers or autoclaves that were developed in 1876 by Charles Chamberlain and it looks just like a pressure cooker and it was literally like a pressure cooker and it was able to reach temperatures of about 248 degrees Fahrenheit um, so that's very comparable to what some of our sterilizers the temperatures that they reach now so 248 degrees Fahrenheit or higher all right high temp sterilization it's subjecting items to thermal energy from moist heat or steam or dry heat. Now for this, we are only talking about steam. We're not even going into dry heat. Dry heat, she's, she's not happening in, during this conversation. Steam is the most frequently used sterilant for devices that are not heat sensitive because of its successful record of safety, efficacy, reliability, and low cost. Steam sterilization leaves no chemical residues or byproducts and dry heat sterilization is rarely used because of lengthy exposure times. Um, I don't know what the likelihood of them asking you about dry heat sterilization is on the exam, but I really would not spend too much time worrying about it. Okay, the absolutely most important step in sterilization or high level disinfection is what? Decontamination. Yes, cleaning. You want to make sure that your instruments are getting cleaned, okay? 
starting at the point of use. Just want to point that out. Point of use. Yes, very good, Charles. He knows. He knows. So sterilization cannot be achieved if an instrument or device has not been thoroughly cleaned. You see this lovely instrument here to the right that just looks terrible. Bioburden can act as a shield on instruments and make it difficult for sterilization. So this is an example of, for those of you who play video games, this is God of War. In God of War, he has this function where he's able to bring down all of these shields and then attack. And that's how um, biofilm basically acts. It's a shield. So if you toss this into a sterilizer, that's not gonna work. You have all of this bio burden that's acting as a shield. So if it's not clean, it's not sterile. You guys now say, if it's not clean, it's not sterile. Marwell, Charles, those of you that I can see. Okay, so my friends are not participating. Who is screaming? <laughs> Like, what is that? Is that, is that your house, Liz? Is someone dying? It's, it's Ivan. He has a video on that he's playing. Okay. No, I'm just curious. Like, cool. <laughs> yeah, so if it's not clean, it's not sterile. you got to remember this. Okay, so steam sterilization. There are four basic things that you need to focus on when it comes to steam sterilization. Steam or moisture, the pressure, um, the temperature, and the time. Now, Isham will have four different categories well they'll have contact um moisture temperature and time my mac is about to die please hold okay all right jesus oh, my back okay all right, sorry, my back's really hurting today. Um, so you have steam, pressure, temperature, and time. The two most common steam sterilizing temperatures are gonna be 250 degrees and 270 degrees. This is really important. You are gonna be asked about time, I mean about temperatures when it comes to sterilization. Um, so you wanna make sure that you're remembering your sterilization temperatures for the different types of sterilization methods that you use. So this is the anatomy of steam sterilizers. So most of the sterilizers that we use in the hospitals are jacketed sterilizers. So you can see here this red, um, this red here, that's the jacket of the sterilizer. So steam's gonna be coming into that jacket, start heating up that chamber, those chamber walls before that steam is coming from the jacket into the chamber. Um, and so that's what they mean by jacketed sterilizers. This is the part, the, the, the anatomy of the sterilizer that you're not really able to see when it's, I mean, it's helpful to understand it because then you actually know what's going on. So the chamber walls are gonna be getting heated and then you have all of these different other fun parts um, that are important in your sterilizer. So your door, your door is considered the weakest part of the sterilizer. And a lot of our sterilizers have um, safety mechanisms where, where it'll be a pressurized system. So once you reach a certain pressure within the chamber, it'll have this like automatic safety feature where it'll lock and it will not come back down until that pressure um, has lowered to a safe, you know, you know, to a safe level so that that door doesn't come flying out because this is the weakest part of the sterilizer. Now your gasket is going to be that rubber, um, you know, that that forms that tight seal in the sterilizer so that you don't have steam coming out. It's really important because if that gasket is damaged, it can interfere with your sterilization cycles. So they need to be inspected daily and cleaned with a non linting cloth. Next, you'll have your chamber drain. So you can't really see it here in this picture, but you'll see it on the next slide. And that's going to be located towards the front or to the center of the floor. And that needs to be cleaned daily or at minimum. That chamber drain can get clogged. And that's that little picture here of an example of a drain. If that chamber drain gets clogged, it can cause a lot of issues for your sterilization. So you can see over here, um, you have that drain. This is where your chamber, um, where, the, where the chamber drain would be, that little, that little drain that I showed. Um, but another really important part is your thermostatic trap. So the thermostatic trap is what really helps to control a lot of how the, um, how the sterilizer will work and how it will start to relieve that pressure. Um, so, most often, steam traps are temperature-sensitive valves that close when heated part 
at a certain set point. And then that area of the sterilizer where you have your thermostatic trap and your cold water supply is gonna be um, where it's the coolest area of a sterilizer. So what happens during your cycle? You have your conditioning where steam enters the upper back portion of the sterilizer. You have the exposure. So once, you're, once you reach the appropriate temperature, um, that's when this, the cycle will begin that exposure phase, which for steam sterilizers is not very long. The exhaust is when the chamber drain is opened and steam is removed from the drain. And then drying begins at the conclusion of the exhaust phase. Yes, we do. Okay. So here we have our gravity displacement steam sterilizers. With your gravity displacement steam sterilizers, you're gonna have that steam entering at the top or the sides of the sterilizing chamber. And because steam is lighter than air, it forces air out of the bottom of the chamber through the drain. Gravity cycle typically requires more exposure time because the air removal method is more passive in nature and temperature is usually around 250 degrees Fahrenheit. So. Can you get to higher temperatures with gravity displacement steam sterilizers? Absolutely. Your sterilization cycles are going to depend on what you're placing into the sterilizer. And all of that ties back into your instructions for use, your manufacturer's IFUs. All of that will tie in together on what, um, what parameters you're gonna set for that sterilization cycle. But for the test, I want you to remember the temperatures. So for gravity, I want you to remember it's a bit lower than steam, it's, around, it's right around 250. For your dynamic air removal, it's gonna be around 270 to 275. You would never have dynamic air removal at 250, okay? So remember your temperatures. All right, so dynamic air removal sterilizers. You're gonna have your pre-vacuum steam sterilizers and your steam flush pressure pulse sterilizers. So these operate at higher temperatures, like I said, 270 to 275. Um, and then we'll learn a little bit more about them. Oh wait, sorry, I meant to read this. So the high-speed vacuum sterilizers are similar to gravity displacement sterilizers, except that they are fitted with a vacuum pump or ejector to ensure air removal from the sterilization chamber and load before the steam is admitted. The advantage of using a vacuum pump is that there is nearly instantaneous steam penetration even into porous loads. All right, steam flush pressure pulse sterilizers. Now these I am not as familiar with. Um, I was talking to Charles today and I was like, do we even have these at the hospital? Because I've never with my own eyeball seen one. I knew we had the pre-vacuum ones, but I wasn't sure that we did. And um, our SPD leader confirmed, no, we actually don't. But what do you need to know about them? They're a little bit different. Um, steam flush pressure pulsing processes remove air rapidly by repeatedly alternating a steam flush and a pressure pulse above atmospheric pressure. Air is rapidly removed from the load as with the pre-vacuum sterilizer, but air leaks do not affect this process because the steam in the sterilizing chamber is always above atmospheric pressure. So when you're looking at these graphs, you can see like there are very clear differences at how the sterilization process is happening within each different type of steam sterilizer. They're not all the same. So this is an example, thank you Charles for taking these today, but this is an example of cycle times for steam sterilizers. So you can see um, in this, the label on the left, we have the pre-vacuum sterilizer at 270 for four minutes with a 30 minute dry time. So they are pre-printed and uh, you know prior to your instruments going in there. And a lot of this at our facility is automated because you have already input all of your manufacturer's instructions, your IFUs into our sensor track system that is tracking the different types of trays that we're doing, the different types of equipment that we're doing and where they would go. This is an example of what a physical monitor would look at. So this is an actual printout of what a sterilization cycle will look at. And you can see that with a pre-vacuum filter, you have the pressure, pre-vacuum, pressure, pre-vacuum, pressure, pre-vacuum. Once you reach where you need to be, you're gonna have the heating up and it's not that long. I always thought, oh, they're in there for so long. It must be because they're getting sterilized for forever. But there's all of these different parameters that need to be met before you can have your four minutes of sterilization. Okay, so minimum cycle times for steam sterilization. This is gonna be from your CDC document. Um, if you haven't had the time to read it or go through bits of it, I highly recommend it. Um, something that's really important when you're an infection preventionist or you're working in public health is to know your resources. You should be able to know 
where do I need to go to find this information? And if you don't know where to go, then you should typically know at least a resource of a person who's an expert who can guide you in that direction. Um, so this document is really important. Gravity displacement, remember how I mentioned there, it's a little bit of a lower temperature. You see the 250 degrees Fahrenheit here. It's not applicable for our dynamic air removal sterilizers, okay? So like I mentioned, it's gonna vary depending on the type of instrument that you're placing. Do you need to, do you need to memorize this? No, you don't need to memorize this, okay? I don't remember, I didn't memorize it. I'm not gonna memorize it, but I know exactly where I need to go to find this information. All right, now IUSS or immediate use steam sterilization. Um, some people call it flash. Flash is a little bit of an outdated term. Um, it's a cooler name <laughs> than IUSS, but we now refer to it as IUSS, immediate use steam sterilization. So flash steam sterilization was originally defined by Underwood and Perkins as sterilization of an unwrapped object at 269.6 degrees Fahrenheit for three minutes at 27 to 28 pounds. Um, this is not recommended as a routine sterilization method. What you need to know about IUSS is that this needs to be something truly emergent. It is a one-of-a-kind instrument. There is absolutely no other way for us to get this instrument um, cleaned and you know reprocessed, sterilized, because we're in the middle of a procedure and it's highly needed. We don't have a backup. We don't have a replacement. These are the instances when IUSS is going to be um, permissible. But it has to be within the manufacturer's IFUs that it can be done. If you have an instrument that has fallen on the surgical floor, on the OR floor, and that device has not been approved for IUSS, you cannot do it, all right? So all items do not have IUSS instructions from the device manufacturer. So you'll need to reach out to that device manufacturer if there's any um, item that you're unsure of or instrument that you're unsure of. The items need to be used immediately after, steril after the sterilization cycle, and they cannot be stored for a later time. That is one of the requirements for when you do IUSS. Now, you can get into some problems when you need to use an item immediately after you've done a high temperature sterilization cycle, right? What, what could happen if you have to use an item immediately after it coming out of a sterilizer? Hot. It's hot. Yeah. It's hot, it's real hot. So this is examples of flash steam sterilization parameters. Right at 270, your time under gravity displacement or dynamic air removal or the steam flush um, pressure pulse. So we're still reaching, you know, hitting those typical times of about four minutes, but there's all of this other stuff that we're not able to, to do appropriately. So what are some adverse events that have happened with IUSS? When evaluating an increased incidence of neurosurgical infections, the investigators noted that surgical instruments were flash sterilized between cases and two of three craniotomy infections involved plate implants that were flash sterilized. A report of two patients who received burns during surgery from instruments that had been flash sterilized reinforced the need to develop policies and educate staff to prevent the use of instruments hot enough to cause clinical burns. Patient burns may be prevented by either air cooling the instrument or immersion in sterile liquid. Staff should use precautions to prevent burns with potentially hot instruments like a transport tray or using heat protective gloves. So burns. All right, now let's get into low temperature. So remember your high temperature, you're gonna do, do your steam sterilizers and you're gonna have two different types, right? For steam sterilizers, which are Gravity, and then the other one starts with a D. Dynamic air removal. Dynamic air removal, yes. You have to remember, you have your gravity and then you have your dynamic air removal. And then that dynamic air removal will stem off and we'll have two more with your pre-vacuum and then your um, sterile flash pressure pulse, that one, the one I don't know a lot about. So low temperature sterilization essentials for those who like to listen to lectures. I enjoyed listening to his lecture on it. Um, I consume information through lots of different, lots of different ways. I was reading the Isham text for this. I watched videos on YouTube, the guidelines, the CDC guidelines, I was reading through those. So however you best consume information, that's what you have to do. All right, whatever you got to do to pass the test, right? 
So low temp sterilization. Low temperature sterilization is typically used to sterilize unique devices with complex designs and or those made of heat and moisture sensitive materials, including fiber optics, polymers on cameras, flexible scopes, and certain plastics that cannot withstand the heat and moisture associated with steam sterilization. Let's get one thing straight. Steam is superior, all right? Steam is what we want to do at all times, if possible, if humanly possible, we wanna do steam. It's the lowest cost, it's safe, it's efficacious, it's been proven time and time and again to work well. But why do we have these low temperature sterilization options? Because we have heat sensitive instruments. This is why we have these options. Um, so when they ask you what the preferred method for sterilization is, it's gonna be steam, right? But you're gonna have caveats for certain types of instruments or devices. Um, chemicals used to sterilize instruments may have toxic properties. So it's important to know the safety recommendations. With the low temp, you have lots of different, lots of different um, ways that you can achieve low temperature sterilization. So you have to, you have to remember. Uh, that's one of the things that I do remember on the test is they want you to know, is this toxic? Is this not toxic? What are some of the side effects of coming into contact with this, with this type of sterilant? Um, each method may have pros and cons. All right, so these, this, this I feel is a more thorough list of your um, low temperature sterilization methods. You're gonna have ETO, hydrogen peroxide gas plasma, vapor phase hydrogen peroxide, ozone, and then your liquid chemicals. So low temperature sterilization should be done according to manufacturer's instructions. Appropriate PPE should be worn and monitoring should be conducted. Monitoring is very important. The permissible exposure limit is a legal limit in the US for exposure of an employee to a chemical substance or physical agent such as a high level noise. So for all of these different types of sterilants, you are gonna have permissible exposure limits that are set by OSHA and they have it all listed out on their website. You also have time weighted averages, which is the amount of exposure to a physical or chemical agent that can happen over a work shift, typically around eight hours. Safety is gonna be important. So starting with ETO, ethylene oxide. This has been widely used as a low temperature sterilant since the 1950s. I can tell you it's a lot more uncommon now. There's a lot of places that have gotten rid of ETO. Um, why? Because it's toxic AF. It's super toxic. Like it is, it is so, it is not good. It's classified as a toxic gas by OSHA a carcinogen and a reproductive hazard. Um, so, and we'll learn a little bit more about some of the things that it has done, but it's very toxic. Remember ETO, there's a T in it, it's toxic, okay? ETO, it's got a T in it, it's toxic. Um, ETO is provided in individual dose cartridges that get placed inside of the chamber. And then the cycle takes approximately 2.5 hours. It can go as long as six. And this is just, this is just the, the initial, uh, cycle that doesn't even touch the aeration. The aeration can take about eight to 12 hours. So we're talking about running one of these cycles. It's like a, a day long thing. There's no such thing as, oh, you know, this needs to go through ETO. I'm going to use it for my case later today. Like, no, absolutely not. You, it's a long, long, long cycle. So your different ETO stages, you have your preconditioning and humidification, your gas introduction, your exposure, which is about 2.5 hours, uh, could be as long as six, your evacuation, and then your aeration, which minimum of eight hours. Um, why is that so important? Um, ETO can stay on instruments and cause a lot of issues, right? We already mentioned that ETO is very toxic. So imagine if it stays on an instrument and that instrument gets used on a patient. Yeah. All right, so the microbiocidal activity of ETO is considered to be the result of alkylation of protein, DNA, and RNA. Alkylation or the replacement of a hydrogen atom with an alkyl group within cells prevent normal cellular metabolism and replication. ETO inactivates all microorganisms, although bacterial spores, especially Bacillus atrophius, are more resistant than other microorganisms. For this reason, Bacillus atrophius is recommended biological indicator. 
We're not gonna get into chemical indicators, biological indicators. Um, just know that there's two primary biological indicators that we'll use, um, either Geobacillus steothermophilus or the Bacillus atrophius, um, but we're not gonna get into that today. So safety, ETO is a colorless gas that is flammable and explosive. OSHA regulates the acceptable vapor levels of ETO due to concerns that exposure represents an occupational hazard. That's gonna be your permissible exposure limits and your time-weighted average. Acute exposure to ETO may result in irritation to the skin, eyes, GI, and respiratory tract, and central nervous system depression. Chronic inhalation has been linked to the formation of cataracts, cognitive impairment, neurological dysfunction, and disabling poly polyneuropathies. Occupational exposure in healthcare facilities has been linked to hematologic changes and an increased risk of spontaneous abortions and various cancers. Do you guys see why we don't really use this at a lot of places? Like it is, yeah, it's very, very toxic. So next we're gonna get to other methods of low temp, which is your hydrogen peroxide gas plasma or your vapor phase hydrogen peroxide. Now your CDC document does talk about vapor phase hydrogen peroxide, but it doesn't include it under the main low temp sterilization. It includes it under, under other methods of sterilization. Um, so hydrogen peroxide gas plasma. Gas plasmas have been referred to as the fourth state of matter, liquids, solids, gases, and gas plasmas. Gas plasmas are generated in an enclosed chamber under deep vacuum using radio frequency or microwave energy to excite the gas molecules and produce charged particles, many of which are in the form of free radicals. It uses a hydrogen peroxide solution ranging from 59 to 95%. Why is it popular? It's much safer. It has rapid cycle times in comparison, in comparison to that ETO, which is like a day long trip. And then obviously you're gonna have a faster turnaround time for your medical devices. So when you go down to your SPD, you're gonna notice that they're gonna have different forms of sterilizers that they're using. There's a reason for that. There's a reason for why they look different. They work differently. Um, so go take a tour, look at what they're using. Hydrogen peroxide gas plasma. Um, so you're gonna basically, they come in these little um, cassettes. So if you look up here um, under the sterad, you can see like there's a little entry point. There are these cassettes that you will put in there. Um, and that's how they'll, they'll get access to the hydrogen peroxide. Those cassettes will get punctured through the cycles. Um, so the sterilization chamber is evacuated and hydrogen peroxide solution is injected from a cassette and is vaporized in the sterilization chamber, okay? The hydrogen peroxide vapor diffuses throughout the chamber, exposes all surfaces of the load of the sterlin and initiates the inactivation of microorganisms. The byproducts of the cycle are water vapor and oxygen. So these are non-toxic and eliminate the need for aeration, which remember for ETO, we needed to have this super long aeration cycle because it's very toxic and that can't get on a patient. Um, with your hydrogen peroxide gas plasma, you have water vapor and oxygen. So this is a lot safer. They can be handled safely. Um, there's, it's just much safer, it's preferred. So which low temperature sterilization method is considered safer, ETO or hydrogen peroxide gas plasma? E. Definitely ETO. I'm just making sure you guys are listening. All right, so the byproducts, uh, I can't read, where's my thingy? The byproducts of the cycle, water vapor and oxygen are non-toxic, eliminating the need for a lengthy aeration phase. Okay, so continued. Examples of instruments that may be sterilized with hydrogen peroxide gas plasma include single channel flexible endoscopes, cameras, rigid endoscopes, light cords, batteries, and power drills. So when you actually go and you spend time in an SPD department, you will see that when instruments are getting dropped off, they will get dropped off to their respective sections. So you have your decontam sinks that are meant for your, your instruments that are gonna go through the washer disinfectors and then get sent back and put through the sterilizer. And then you have um, the areas where you're dropping off for ultrasonic. You have the area where you're dropping off for low temperature sterilization. This area is typically separated. You have, it has its own sink area and it has more than likely a drying cabinet. Moisture really interferes with hydrogen gas plasma cycles. Um, you do not want to have any moisture on there. Okay, sorry, I'm getting out of order. There's just so much I need to say. So it's not compatible with liquids and powders, any material that absorbs liquids. 
Um, items that contain cellulose, like cotton, paper, cardboard, linens, all of that stuff. Um, there are compact systems or large systems, which can range from a runtime from 28 to 75 minutes, but it depends on the unit that you're using. And then excess moisture remaining on devices can cause the cycle to abort. So when you're getting ready to load these trays to go through hydrogen peroxide gas plasma, one of the things that you really get trained in is you have to make sure there's no moisture. They like, they like really beat that into your brain. Cause when I was getting ready, you know, to load our hydrogen gas peroxide gas plasma, they would always be like, did you check the tray? Did you lift? Did you make sure everything was wiped off? We can't have any moisture because that cycle will abort. All right, vaporized hydrogen peroxide. So this is a section that CDC has in their document. Um, vaporized hydrogen peroxide offers several appealing features that include a rapid cycle time, low temp, environmentally safe, good material compatibility and ease of operation, installation and monitoring. Um, VP, VHP has limitations, including that cellulose cannot be processed, nylon becomes brittle, and VHP penetration capabil capabilities are less than those of ETO. VHP has not been cleared by FDA for sterilization of medical devices in healthcare facilities. All right, so ozone sterilization. This was cleared by FDA in August of 2003 for processing reusable medical devices. Um, the sterilizer creates its own sterilin internally from USP grade oxygen, steam quality water, and electricity. The sterilin is converted back to oxygen and water vapor at the end of the cycle by a by passing through a catalyst before being exhausted into the room. The duration of the, cycle is, the sterilization cycle is about four hours and 15 minutes. So this is definitely longer than the hydrogen peroxide gas plasma, um, but it occurs at a, you know, a bit of a lower temperature. Microbial efficacy has been demonstrated by achieving a sterility assurance level of 10 to the negative six with a variety of microorganisms to include the most resistant microorganism Geobacillus stereothermophilus. I can, I can never say that one, but just remember that one, okay? And the Bacillus atrophius. All right, so let's do some questions. So which of the following sterilization methods has been cleared by the FDA for processing reusable medical devices? A is microwaves, B is ozone, C is glass bead sterilizers, or D is ionizing radiation? B. Ozone. B. Perfect. Now, these guys are smart. All, now, all of these other ones, I remember I was like, oh, those sound so crazy. They're listed in the CDC document. So if you want to go learn more about them, you can find them under their other serialization category. They'll mention all of these different things. All right. Which of the following microbes is the least resistant to sterilization? A, poliovirus, B, HIV, C, cryptosporidium parvum, or D, mycobacterium tuberculosis? HIV. Okay, I have one answer. A, two. poliovirus. Okay, anybody else? Um, mm-mm. No? Okay. Cryptosporidium, that sounds pretty. <laughs> He's like, that sounds pretty intense. Okay. So um, two that I, I would immediately cross off would be my crypto and my mycobacterium tuberculosis. So when they're asking you about something that is least resistant or most resistant, I want you to think about that pathogen's intrinsic abilities. So when you're looking at your disinfectants or, you know, your disinfectant classifications, you have virucidal, bactericidal, tuberculocidal, sporocidal, right? With each category, you're getting into a, basically a stronger set of pathogens for the most part. Can you have some viruses that are a little bit more hardy? Absolutely. But for the most part, we should be able to narrow this down to, okay, it's either going to be HIV or poliovirus. And the correct answer is HIV. Why is it not clicking? I don't know. Hmm. I was just looking at the chat and it appears as if people in the chat don't agree with your answer. 
<laughs> really? I can't see the chat and I can't find my mouse. Oh, here's my mouse. There's uh, seven A's and zero B's. Why isn't it letting me go? I can't, I can't with computers. I don't know how to make it go to the next one. Okay, oh, I figured it out. There we go. So microbes have differing resistance to sterilization based on their physical and chemical properties. Vegetative bacteria, um, such as staph aureus and lipid, sorry, and lipid or medium-sized viruses such as HIV are the least resistant of all microbes to sterilization. All right, oh, how do I clear that? Clear, clear all drawings. Okay, blank is the most frequently used sterilant for devices not adversely affected by moisture or heat because of its successful record of safety, efficacy, reliability, and low cost. Which one is this one? Steam. Steam. Good job, steam. Remember, we always want to use steam if we can, but if we can't, then we have other options. All right, so this one is one that we really didn't cover, but when loading the steam sterilizer, the packages must touch the chamber wall. Is this true or false? Must touch? No, they can't oh, touch the chamber oh, wall. <laughs> I mean, they do when I load it, but they ain't supposed to. <laughs> Right, so no, you don't want them touching your chamber wall. Remember, you have that jacket that's heating up. You want all of that steam penetrating into your instruments. You don't want for your instruments to ever be touching your chamber walls ever, 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 ever. That's why you have to be really um, careful at how you load your sterilizer and make sure that you have everything packed accordingly and appropriately and that you are not, um, you know, that you're not like basically stuffing your sterilizer full of stuff because that will be a problem. All right, so blank sterilizers remove air from the chamber by steam forcing the cooler air in the chamber out through the drain. A, ETO, B, gravity steam sterilizer, C, ozone, D, hydrogen peroxide gas plasma. Gravity. Solius I agree. gravity. Charles, I agree. Charles seconds gravity. I agree with gravity. Marwell agrees with gravity. Good job. Gravity steam sterilizer is correct. All right, which of the following processes should be used for contaminated endotracheal blades? A, cleaning followed by sterilization, B, cleaning followed by high level disinfection, C, cleaning followed by ultrasonic washer, or D, cleaning followed by alcohol disinfection? B. What, I heard a B in. B. B? Mm -hmm. Okay, everyone's saying B. Does anyone disagree with B? Yeah, I do. They have, they have lights in them, so you probably shouldn't use... Uh, oh, I guess you could. I like B. Never mind. Talk me into it. Yeah, so cleaning followed by high-level disinfection is appropriate. Good job. Sorry, I read that wrong. <laughs> when you, whenever you start thinking about that, I want you to remember what is this going to come into contact with? Like, yeah. at what point am I going to be using this? How, how is, like, what is this coming into contact with? All right. This is a long question. Will you get questions like this on the test? Absolutely. Absolutely. And when you see that a document is referenced over and over and over and over again, like the CDC guidelines for cleaning disinfection and sterilization that were published in 2008, you can bet money that it will be on the test. So personally, I think that that document has a lot more useful information than the chapter of the book, but that's just me. Um, so question seven, which of the following recommendations related to disinfection and sterilization in the health in Healthcare facilities is a CDC category 1A recommendation. One, before use on each patient, sterilize critical medical and surgical devices and instruments that enter normally sterile tissue or the vascular system or through which a sterile body fluid flows. Two, meticulously clean patient care items with water and detergent 
or with water and enzymatic cleaners before high level disinfection or sterilization procedures. Three, in hospitals, perform most cleaning, disinfection, and sterilization of patient care devices in a central processing department in order to more easily control quality. Or four, perform low level disinfection for non critical patient care surfaces like bed rails, over the bed table, and equipment that touch intact skin. So which one of those is a category 1A recommendation? I want to say it's D. Does anyone disagree? This was just on a practice test that I did. And I don't remember, but I think it's a D. I picked it on the test. Anyone else? Is this question a little scary? No. Charles is like, no. Fine. Marwell, what do you think? I'm thinking C, but that third part, that third, um, a third point is also very valid. So, uh -huh. but just for the sake of conflict, I'm gonna go with C. Okay, and then Taylor, what do you think? Um, Taylor, this I'm isn't necessarily <laughs> how you you trust more me or Marwell, but I mean, you go with your gut. I just hope it's D. I was actually thinking C as well. Okay, so we have why I don't know. It's a complete guess. She's like, that's what I'm being drawn to. Okay, so these questions are gonna be a little bit more tricky because what I will tell you is every single one of these is a CDC recommendation. Every single one of these is a CDC recommendation. What's well, one A? The issue is that you have to try to remember your different categories. Um, and this is gonna be really, really difficult. Um, are you gonna be able to remember all of them? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. So you just have to try to do your best to remember what you can from the document, okay? So your rankings, you're gonna have different, like a, like a ranking system for CDC. Category 1A is strongly recommended for implementation and strongly supported by well-designed experimental, clinical, or epidemiologic studies. Category 1B, strongly recommended for implementation and supported by some experimental, clinical, or epidemiologic studies and by a strong theoretical rationale. Category 1C, required by state or federal regulations. Because of state differences, readers should not assume that the absence of an 1C recommendation implies the absence of state regulations. Category 2, suggested for implementation and supported by suggestive clinical or epidemiologic studies or by a theoretical rationale. And then no recommendation, it's an unresolved issue. This includes practices for which insufficient evidence or no consensus exists regarding efficacy. So you start at the top. These are your most likely to be recommended. They have the most support. You have the most papers. It's like chef's kiss, like that is category 1A. So in hospitals performing most cleaning, disinfection and sterilization of patient care devices in a central processing department in order to more easily control quality, category two. Meticulously clean patient care items with water <laughs> or with water and enzymatic cleaners before a high level disinfection or sterilization procedures, category 1B. I don't know why that's not a category 1A, but... Anyway, next. Before use on a patient, sterilize critical medical and surgical devices and instruments that enter normally sterile tissue or the vascular system or through which a sterile body fluid flows. That's the one that's category 1A. So it was only number one. And then the very last one is perform low level disinfection for non-critical patient care surfaces like bed rails and equipment like blood pressure cuffs that touch intact skin. That will be a category two. You're probably wondering, how am I going to remember all of this? It's going to be difficult, but just try to read through the document. And then in your mind, try to think what has the most um, evidence to support it. 
but that's a that's a very that's an example of a very challenging a very difficult question that you could find on the exam that's a very challenging question because everything they wrote is a cdc recommendation just under different categories question eight as a time-saving measure hospital administrators in your facility have suggested that endocavitary probes do not need to undergo high level disinfection because they are used with probe covers. How would you respond to this suggestion? A, agree because the probe cover prevents contact with mucous membranes and non-intact skin. B, disagree because the probe covers are not 100% reliable. C, agree because even without covers, the probes don't contact mucous membranes and non-intact skin during use. Or D, disagree because switching from high level disinfection to low level to low level disinfection will not save time. B. B. Is that D or B? B. B. B as in boy. Okay. Hmm. This was in our this was on my test. It's B. It's definitely B. Can't trust anybody. Don't trust anything. <laughs> Good the only person you trust is the IP in your hospital, and that's it. That's it. And even then, <laughs> we have to make sure we look it up. Um, and then so, no question. so yeah, good job. B disagree because pro covers are not one hundred percent reliable, and this is still an item. It's an endocavitary probe. It meets Spalding classification for what is it? Non-critical, semi-critical, or critical? Semi-critical. So if you have a Spalding classification as semi-critical, at minimum, you have to do high-level disinfection, high level disinfection, point period blank, there's no questions asked. That is what the classification was made for so that you know what type of disinfection is necessary for that, um, for that instrument or device. All right, question nine, which of the following are used for sterilization of medical instruments? One, a gravity displacement steam sterilizer, two, a pasteurizer, three, clean oxide sterilizer or for an ultrasonic cleaner Marvel. <laughs> well, it's like I'm thinking all right what what answers do you guys think what do you think is the right answer I'm going with B Leah what do you think it is um I'm gonna go with the, uh, I don't know. I'm gonna go with the, uh, let's go with C for the sake of conflict. C for the sake of conflict, okay. Taylor? You want, you want conflict? I got conflict. <laughs> Taylor, what do you think it is? Um, I think B. She thinks it's B. And Casey, what do you think it is? I don't know if Casey's still here. She might not be. Okay, so we have a lot of Bs, which is correct. One to three. Sorry, one and three. So you have your gravity displacement steam sterilizers, which we talked about, ETO. Now, what do we use pasteurizers for? <sighs> Cleaning some miscellaneous junk in East Orlando. I don't know. What type of equipment most of the time? Where, where did we see a pasteurizer, Charles? Respiratory. Respiratory equipment. Yep. High level disinfection of respiratory equipment. Okay. Well, that's it. Does anybody have any questions? So that was a little, so this doesn't really cover everything that you need to know about sterilization. This is like a very, I don't know if it would qualify as high level, but it at least lets you start thinking about sterilization a little bit differently. You have to remember you have your high temp, your low temp. We didn't even go into liquid sterilins. We didn't touch on a lot of different things that you still need to know for sterilization, like what your, um, you know, your chemical indicators, process indicators, biological indicators, Bowie dick test. Um, there's lots of stuff. I mean, we could literally spend hours talking about sterilization. Um, my challenge to you is, if you're at a hospital, if you can get to a hospital, go look at your SPD and ask questions about 
what sterilizer is this? You know, what is this? Is this a pre vacuum? Um, which one is this? This sterad? What is this used for? Actually, go to your department and then look around and ask questions. Those people know a lot of information. I can guarantee you, a, probably a ton of people in your department are certified. Um, so go ask questions and learn. And if you don't have access to a hospital, I would say to start communicating to a local IP or IPs about coming out and touring, even if it's just for like two hours to just go look at what the department looks like um, and then watch some videos on YouTube. I mean, there's nothing like actually being physically present somewhere for you to actually learn things. I think that would be really, really helpful. Yeah. Okay. Does anyone have any other questions or are we good? Because it is, it's nine. Yes, we're okay. Yep. Okay. Good. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Moose. You're very welcome and good luck studying your sterilization. Wait, Liz, are you going to do this more than once for us? Is that the. Are you like starting a little study group? Like, no, we're not starting a study group. Okay. We got to get Dr. Sharif to pass his test, right? So we can like go and full go with your uh, formal study group. He's got to pass his test. That's true. Yeah. Um, no, this was just like a little, you know, like a little. Casey, you got to share lose with us. We never get to see her anymore. Nope. She's all mine. <laughs> Casey said, no. Mm -mm. No, we will not. No, ma'am. Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so okay hopefully this was helpful now that you have this information try reading through the chapter again um try reading through some of those cdc recommendations and then i would highly recommend you go through um in the so in the book in your study guide book go to the section that does cleaning disinfection and sterilization um you know it's going to be like i think 25 questions Go through those questions. Whatever questions you miss, that is what you need to focus on. So it's biological indicators that you're not understanding. Go learn more about biological indicators. If it's the chemical indicators that you're not picking up on, go read through that. If it's the safety that you're messing up, like you're messing up which sterilin is associated with being toxic or being an irritant, focus on whatever you're missing. Um, we have a tendency to want to keep rereading the stuff we're good at, and that's not going to help you pass the test. You got to study the stuff you're not good at. Okay, guys, that's it. Good night. Thank you. You're very welcome. Thank I'll you. I'll give you a call, Casey. So I'll talk to you in a sec. Okay, thank you. All right, bye, guys. Bye. Bye. Deuces. Uh oh, cover us well. Ending. <laughs>